he never can be a friend to the human race who is a preacher of nat natural morality or natural religion. He is a flatterer who means to betray, to perpetuate tyrant pride and the laws of that Babylon, which he foresees shall shortly be destroyed with the spiritual and not the natural sword. He is in the state named Rahab, which state must be put off before he can be the friend of man. You, O oh deists, profess yourself the enemies of Christianity, and you are so. You are also the enemies of the human race and of universal nature. Man is born a specter or Satan and is altogether an evil and requires a new selfhood continually and must continually be changed into his direct contrary. But your Greek philosophy, which is a remnant of Druidism, teaches that man is righteous in his vegetated specter, an opinion of fatal and accursed consequence to man, as the ancients saw plainly by revelation to the entire abrogation of experimental theory, and many believed what they saw and prophesied of Jesus. Man must and will have some religion. If he is not the religion of Jesus, he will have the religion of Satan and will erect the synagogue of Satan, calling the prince of this world God and destroying all those who do not worship Satan under the name of God. Will anyone say, where are those who worship Satan under the name of God? Where are they? Listen, every religion that preaches vengeance for sin is the religion of the enemy and avenger, and not the forgiver of sin. And their God is Satan, named by the divine name. Your religion, O deists, deism, is the worship of the God of this world by the means of what you call natural religion and natural philosophy, and of natural morality or self-righteousness, the selfish virtues of the natural heart. This was the religion of the Pharisees who murdered Jesus. Deism is the same and ends the same. Voltaire, Rousseau, Gibbon, Hume charged the spiritually religious with hypocrisy. But how a monk or a Methodist either can be a hypocrite, I cannot conceive. We are men of like passions with others and pretend not to be holier than others. Therefore, when a religious man falls into sin, he ought not be called a hypocrite. This title is more properly to be given to a player who falls into sin, whose profession is virtue and morality and the making men self-righteous. Foot in calling Whitefield hypocrite was himself one, for Whitefield pretended not to be holier than others, but confessed his sins before all the world. Voltaire, Rousseau, you cannot escape my charge that you are Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are constantly talking of the virtues of the human heart, and particularly of your own, that you may accuse others, and especially the religious, whose errors you, by this display of pretended virtue, chiefly designed to expose. Rousseau thought men good by nature, he found them evil and found no friend. Friendship cannot exist without forgiveness of sins continually. The book written by Rousseau called his confession is an apology and cloak for his sin is not a confession. But you also charge the poor monks and religious with being the causes of war Will you acquit and flatter the Alexanders and Caesars, the Lewises and Fredericks, who alone are its cause and its actors? But the religion of Jesus, forgiveness of sin, can never be the cause of a war, nor of a single martyrdom. Those who martyr others or who cause war are deists, but never can be forgivers of sin. The glory of Christianity is to conquer by forgiveness and the deconstruction and the destruction therefore in Christian Europe has arisen from deism, which is natural religion. 
I saw a monk of Charlemagne arise before my sight. I talked with the gray monk as we stood in beams of infernal light. Gibbon arose with a lash of steel and Voltaire with a racking wheel. The schools in clouds of learning rolled, arose with war in iron and gold. Thou lazy monk, they sound afar, in vain condemning glorious war, and in your cell you shall ever dwell. Rise, war, and bind him in his cell. The blood red round from the gray monk's side. His hands and feet were wounded wide. His body bent, his arms and knees, like to the roots of ancient trees. When Satan first the black bow bent, when Satan first the black bow bent and the moral law from the gospel rent, he forged the law into a sword and spilled the blood of mercy's Lord. Titus, Constantine, Charlemagne, O Voltaire, Rousseau, Gibbon, vain your Grecian mocks and Roman sword against this image of his Lord. For a tear is an intellectual thing, and a sigh is the sword of an angel king, and the bitter groan of a martyr's woe is an arrow from the Almighty's bow. Jerusalem, chapter 3. But Los, whose the vehicular form of strong Orthona, wept vehemently over Albion, where Thames currents spring from the rivers of Beulah, pleasant river, soft, mild parent stream. And the roots of Albion's tree entered the soul of Los, as he sat before his furnaces, clothed in sackcloth of hair, in gnawing pain, dividing him from his emanation enclosing all the children of Los time after time, their giant forms condensing into nations and peoples and tongues, translucent the furnaces of beryl and emerald immortal, and sevenfold each within the other, incomprehensible to the vegetated mortal eyes, perverted and single vision. The bellows are the animal's lungs, the hammers, the animal heart, the furnaces, the stomach for digestion, terrible their fury, like seven burning heavens ranged from south to north. Here on the banks of the Thames, loose builded Golganusa, outside of the gates of the human heart, beneath Beulah, in the midst of the rocks of the altars of Albion. In fears he builded it, in rage and in fury. It is the spiritual fourfold London, continually building and continually decaying, desolate. In eternal labors, loud the furnaces and loud the anvils of death, thunder incessant around the flaming couches of the twenty-four friends of Albion, and round the awful four for the protection of the twelve emanations of Albion's sons. The mystic union of the emanation in the Lord, because man, divided from his emanation, is a dark specter. His emanation is an ever-weeping, melancholy shadow. But she is made receptive of generation through mercy in the potter's furnace, among the funeral urns of Beulah, from Surrey Hills, through Italy and Greece, to Hinnom's Vale. In great eternity, every particular form gives forth or emanates its own peculiar light, and the form is the divine vision, and the light is his garment. This is Jerusalem in every man, a tent and tabernacle of mutual forgiveness, male and female clothings. And Jerusalem is called liberty among the children of Albion. But Albion fell down, a rocky fragment from eternity hurled by his own specter, who is the reasoning power in every man, 
into his own chaos, which is the memory between man and man. The silent broodings of deadly revenge springing from the all-powerful parental affection fills Albion from head to foot. The silent broodings of deadly revenge springing from the all-powerful parental affection fills Albion from head to foot. Seeing his sons assimilate with Luva, bound in the bonds of spiritual hate, from which springs sexual love as iron chains. He tosses like a cloud outstretched among Jerusalem's ruins, which overspread all the earth. He groans among his ruined porches. But the specter like a hoarfrost and a mildew rose over Albion, saying, I am God, O sons of men. I am your rational power. Am I not Bacon and Newton and Locke? who teach humility to man, who teach doubt and experiment, and my two wings of Voltaire, Rousseau? Where is that friend of sinners, that rebel against my laws, who teaches belief to the nations and an unknown eternal life? Come hither into the desert and turn these stones to bread. Vain, foolish man, wilt thou believe without experiment and build a world of fantasy upon my great abyss, a world of shapes in craving lust and devouring appetite? So spoke the hard, cold, constrictive spectre. He is named Arthur, constricting into druid rocks round Canaan, Agag, and Aram, and Pharaoh. Then Albion drew England into his bosom in groans and tears, but she stretched out her starry night in spaces against him, like a long serpent in the abyss of the spectre, which augmented the night with dragon wings covered with stars, and in the wings Jerusalem and Vela appeared, and above, between the wings, magnificent, the divine vision dimly appeared in clouds of blood, weeping. When those who disregard all mortal things saw a mighty one among the flowers of Beulah still retain his awful strength, they wondered, checking their wild flames and many gathering together into an assembly. They said, let us go down and see these changes. Others said, if you do so, prepare for being driven from our fields. What have we to do with death? To be their inferiors or superiors, we equally abhor. Superior none we know, inferior none. All equal share divine benevolence and joy. For the eternal man walketh among us, calling us his brothers and his friends forbidding us that veil which Satan puts between Eve and Adam, by which the princes of the dead enslave their votaries, teaching them to form the serpent of precious stones and gold, to seize the sons of Jerusalem and plant them in one man's loins, to make one family of contraries, that Joseph may be sold into Egypt for negation, the veil Avail the Saviour born and dying wrens. But others said, Let us to him who only is, and who walketh among us, give decision. Bring forth all your fires. So saying, an eternal deed was done. In fiery flames the universal concave raged. Such thunderous sounds as never were sounded from a mortal cloud nor on Mount Sinai old, nor in Havilah, where the cherub rolled his redounding flame. Loud, loud, the mountains lifted up their voices, loud the forests, rivers thundered against their banks, loud winds furious fought, loud, loud, the mountains lifted up their voices, loud the forests, rivers thundered against their banks, Loud winds furious fought, cities and nations contended in fires and clouds and tempests. 
The seas raised up their voices and lifted their hands on high. The stars in their courses fought, the sun, moon, heaven, earth, contending for Albion and for Jerusalem, his emanation, and for Shiloh, the emanation of France, lovely Vala. Then far the greatest number were about to make a separation, and they elected seven, called the seven eyes of God, Lucifer, Moloch, Elohim, Shaddai, Pahad, Jehovah, Jesus. They named the eighth, he came not, he hid in Albion's forests, but first they said, and their words stood in chariots in array, curbing their tigers with golden bits and bridles of silver and ivory. Let the human organs be kept in their perfect integrity, at will contracting into worms or expanding into gods. And then behold, what are these Ulro visions of chastity? Then as the moss upon the tree, or the dust upon the plough, or as the sweat upon the laboring shoulder, or as the chaff of the wheat floor, or as the dregs of the sweet wine press. Such are these all row visions. For though we sit down within the ploughed furrow, listening to the weeping clods till we contract or expand space at will, or if we raise ourselves upon the chariots of the morning, contracting or expanding time. Everyone knows we are one family, one man forever blessed. Silence remained, and everyone resumed his human majesty, and many conversed on these things as they labored at the furrow, saying, It is better to prevent misery than to release from misery. It is better to prevent error than to forgive the criminal. Labor well the minute particulars, attend to the little ones, and those who are in misery cannot remain so long. If we do but our duty, labor well the teeming earth. They plowed in tears, the trumpets sounded before the golden plow, and the voices of the living creatures were heard in the clouds of heaven, crying, Compel the reasoner to demonstrate with unhewn demonstrations. Let the indefinite be explored, and let every man be judged by his own works. Let all indefinites be thrown into demonstrations to be pounded to dust and melted in the furnaces of affliction. He who would do good to another must do it in minute particulars. General good is the plea of the scoundrel and hypocrite and flatterer. For art and science cannot exist but in minutely organized particulars and in not in generalizing demonstrations of the rational power. The infinite alone resides in definite and determinate identity. Establishment of truth depends on destruction of falsehood continually, on circumcision, not on virginity, O reasoners, of Albion. So cried they at the plough, Albion's rock frowned above, and the great voice of eternity rolled above terrible in clouds, saying, Who will go forth for us, and who shall we send before our face? Then Los heaved his thundering bellows on the valley of Middlesex, and thus he chanted his song. The daughters of Albion reply, what may man be, who can tell, but what may woman be, to have power over man from cradle to corruptible grave? He who is an infant, and whose cradle is a manger, knoweth the infant's sorrow, whence it came, and where it goeth, and who weave it a cradle of the grass, that withereth away. This world is all a cradle for the erred and wandering phantom. Rocked by year, month, day, and hour, and every two moments between dwells a daughter of Beulah to feed the human vegetable. And tune, daughters of Albion, your hymning chorus mildly, chord of affection thrilling ecstatic on the iron reel, to the golden loom of love, to the moth-labored wolf, 
a garment and cradle weaving for the infantine terror, for fear at entering the gate into our world of cruel lamentation, it flee black it flee it flee back and hide in non entities dark wild, where dwells the spectre of Albion, destroyer of definite form. The sun shall be a scythe chariot of Britain, the moon a ship in the British Ocean, created by Losa's hammer, measured out into days and nights and years and months, to travel with my feet over these desolate rocks of Albion. O oh, daughters of despair, rock the cradle, and in mild melodies, tell me where found what you have inwoven with so much tears and care, so much tender artifice, to laugh, to weep, to learn, to know, remember, recollect what dark befell in wintry days. He who is an infant and whose cradle is a manger knoweth the infant's sorrow, whence it came and where it goeth and who weave it a cradle of the grass that withereth away. And who weave it a cradle of the grass that withereth away. This world is all a cradle for the erd and wandering phantom, rocked by year, month, day, and hour, and every two moments between dwells a daughter of Beulah to feed the human vegetable. And tune, daughters of Albion, your hymning chorus mildly, chord of affection, thrilling ecstatic on the iron reel, to the golden loom of love, to the moth labored woof, a garment and cradle weaving for the infantine terror, for fear at entering the gate into our world of cruel lamentation. It flee back and hide in non entities dark wild. Where dwells the spectre of Albion, destroyer of definite form? The sun shall be a scythe chariot of Britain, the moon a ship in the British Ocean, created by Losa's hammer, measured out into days and nights and years and months, to travel with my feet over these desolate rocks of Albion, O oh, daughters of despair, rock the cradle, and in, the mild, and in mild melodies, tell me where found what you have inwoven with so much tears and care, so much tender artifice, to laugh, to weep, to learn, to know, remember, recollect what dark befell in wintry days. Oh, it was lost forever, and we found it not. It came and wept at our wintry door. Look, look, behold, Gwendolyn is become a clod of clay. Merlin is a worm of the valley. Then Los uttered with hammer and anvil, Chant, revoice, I mind not your laugh, and your frown I fear not, and you must my dictate obey from your golden-beamed looms. Trill gentle to Albion's watchmen on Albion's mountains. Re-echo and rock the cradle while, ah me, of that eternal man and of that cradled infancy in his bowels of compassion, who fell beneath his instruments of husbandry and became subservient to the clods of the furrow. The cattle and even the emmet and earthworm are his superiors and lords. Then the response came, warbling from trilling looms in Albion. We women tremble at the light, therefore, hiding fearful the divine vision with curtain and veil and fleshly tabernacle. Los uttered, swift as the rattling thunder upon the mountains. Look back into the church, Paul. Look, three women around the cross. O oh, Albion, why didst thou a female will create? And the voices of Bath and Canterbury and York and Edinburgh cry over the plough of nations in the strong hand of Albion, 
thundering along among the fires of the druid and the deep black re-thundering waters of the Atlantic, which poured an impetuous loud, loud, louder and louder, and the great voice of the Atlantic howled over the druid altars, weeping over his children in Stonehenge, in Malden, in Closter, round the rocky peak of Derbyshire, London Stone, and Rosemond Bower. What is a wife, and what is a harlot? What is a church, and what is a theater? Are they two and not one? Can they exist separate? Are not religion and politics the same thing? Brotherhood is religion. O oh, demonstrations of religion dividing families in cruelty and pride. But Albion fled from the divine vision with the plough of nations inflaming the living creatures maddened and Albion fell into the furrow. furrow. And the plough went over him and the living was ploughed in among the dead. But his spectre rose over the starry plough. Albion fled beneath the plough till he came to the rock of ages and he took his seat upon the rock. Wonder seized all in eternity to behold the divine vision open, the center into an expanse, and the center rolled out into an expanse. In beauty, the daughters of Albion divide and unite at will, naked and drunk with blood, Gwendolyn dancing to the timbrel of war, Reeling up the street of London, she divides in twain among the inhabitants of Albion. The people fall around. The daughters of Albion divide and unite in jealousy and cruelty. The inhabitants of Albion are at the harvest and the vintage, feel their brain cut round beneath the temples, shrieking, bonifying into a skull, the marrow exuding in dismal pain. They flee over the rocks, bonifying horses, oxen, feel the knife. And while the sons of Albion, by severe war and judgment, bonify, the hermaphroditic condensations are divided by the knife. The obdurate forms are cut asunder by jealousy and pity. Rational philosophy and mathematic demonstration is divided in the intoxication of pleasure and affection. Two contraries war against each other in fury and blood, and Los fixes them on his anvil, incessant in his blows. He fixes them with strong blows, placing the stones and timbers to create a world of generation from the world of death dividing the masculine and feminine for the commingling of Albion and Luva's specters was hermaphroditic. Urizen, wrathful, strode above dictating the awful building as a mighty temple delivering form out of confusion. Jordan sprang beneath its threshold, bubbling from beneath its pillars, Euphrates ran under its arches, white sails and silver oars reflect on its pillars and sound on its echoing pavements, where walk the sons of Jerusalem who remain unregenerate, but the revolving sun and moon pass through its porticos, day and night, in sublime majesty and silence, they revolve and shine glorious within. Hand and Coben arched over the sun in the hot noon as he traveled through his journey. Heil and Schofield arched over the moon at midnight and Los fixed them there. With his thunderous hammer, terrified, the specters rage and flee. Canaan in his portico, Jordan is a fountain in his porch, a fountain of milk and wine to relieve the traveler. Egypt is the eight steps within. Ethiopia supports his pillars. Libya and the lands unknown are the ascent without. 
Within is Asia and Greece, ornamented with exquisite art. Persia and Medea are his halls. His inmost hall is great Tartary. China and India and Siberia are his temples for entertainment. Poland and Russia and Sweden his soft retired chambers. France and Spain and Italy and Denmark and Holland and Germany are the temples among his pillars. Britain is Los's forge. America, north and south, are his baths of living waters. Such is the ancient world of Urizen in the satanic void, created from the valley of Middlesex by London's river, from Stonehenge and from London Stone, from Cornwell to Cath to Cathnes, the four Zoas rushed around on all sides in dire ruin. Furious in pride of selfhood, the terrible specters of Albion rear their dark rocks among the stars of God. Stupendous works, a world of generation continually creating out of the hermaphroditic satanic world of rocky destiny and formed into four precious stones for entrance from Beulah. For the veil of valor which Albion cast into the Atlantic deep to catch the souls of the dead began to vegetate and petrify around the earth of Albion among the roots of his tree. This los formed into the gates and mighty wall between the oak of weeping and the palm of suffering beneath Albion's tomb. Thus, in process of time, it became the beautiful mundane shell, the habitation of the specters of the dead, the habitation of the specters of the dead and the place of redemption and of awakening again into eternity. For four universes round the mundane egg remain chaotic, one to the north, Erthona, one to the south, Urizen, one to the east, Luva, one to the west, Tarmus. They are the four Zoas that stood round the throne divine, Verulam, London, York, and Edinburgh, their English names. But when Luva assumed the world of Urizen southward, and Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, all fell towards the centre, sinking downwards in dire ruin. In the south remains a burning fire, in the earth, a vo in the east, a void, in the west, a world of raging waters, in the north, solid darkness, unfathomable without end. But in the midst of these is built eternally the sublime universe of Los and Enetharmon. And in the north gate, in the west of the north, toward Beulah, Cathedron's looms are building, and Los's furnaces in the south, a wondrous golden building, immense with ornaments sublime, is bright Cathedron's golden hall, its courts, towers, and pinnacles. And one daughter of Los sat at the fiery reel, and another sat at the shining loom with her sisters attending round. Terrible their distress and their sorrow cannot be uttered. And another daughter of Los sat at the spinning wheel, endless their labor, with bitter food, void of sleep, Though hungry they labor, they rouse themselves anxious, hour after hour laboring at the whirling wheel. Many wheels and as many lovely daughters sit weeping, yet the intoxicating delight that they take in their work obliterates every other evil. None pities their tears, yet they regard not pity, and they expect no one to pity, for they labor for life and love, regardless of any one, but the poor specters that they work for, always incessantly they are mocked by everyone that passes by. They regard not, they labor, and when their wheels are broken by scorn and malice, they mend them, sorrowing with many tears and afflictions. Other daughters weave on the cushion and pillow, network fine that Rahab and 
tourism may exist and live and breathe and love. Ah, uh, that it could be as the daughters of Beulah wish. Other daughters of Los, laboring at looms less fine, create the silkworm and the spider and the caterpillar to assist in their most grievous work of pity and compassion, and others create the woolly lamb and the downy fowl to assist in the work. The lamb bleats, the sea fowl cries, men understand not the distress and the labor and sorrow that the interior worlds is carried on in fear and trembling, weaving the shuddering fears and loves of Albion's families. <clears throat> Thunderous rage, the spindles of iron and the iron distaff maddens in the fury of their hands, weaving in bitter tears the veils of goat's hair and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. The clouds of Albion's druid temples rage in the eastern heaven, while Los sat terrified, beholding Albion's spectre, who is Luva spreading in bloody veins, in torments over Europe and Asia. Not yet formed, but a wretched torment, unformed and abyssal in flaming fire, within the furnaces of the divine vision, appeared on Albion's hills, often walking from the furnaces in clouds and flames, among the druid temples and the starry wheels, gathered Jerusalem's children in his arms and bore them like a shepherd in the night of Albion, which overspread all the earth. I gave thee liberty and life, O lovely Jerusalem, and thou hast bound me down upon the stems of vegetation. I gave thee sheep walks upon the Spanish mountains, Jerusalem, I gave thee Priam city and the isles of Grecia lovely, <clears throat> I gave thee Hand and Schofield and the counties of Albion. They spread forth like a lovely root into the garden of God. They were as Adam before me, united into one man. They stood in innocence and their skyey tent reached over Asia to Nimrod's tower, to Ham and Canaan walking with Mizraim upon the Egyptian Nile, with solemn songs to Grecia and sweet Hesperia, even to Grecian Chaldea and Teshina, following thee as a shepherd by the four rivers of Eden. Why wilt thou rend thyself apart, Jerusalem, and build this Babylon and sacrifice in secret groves among the gods of Asia, among the fountains of pitch and nitre? Therefore but thy mountains are become barren, Jerusalem, thy valleys plain of plains of burning sand, thy rivers waters of death, thy villages die of the famine, and thy cities beg bread from house to house. Lovely Jerusalem, why wilt thou deface thy beauty and the beauty of thy little ones to please thy idols in the pretended chastities of uncircumcision? Thy sons are lovelier than Egypt or Assyria. Wherefore dost thou blacken their beauty as by a secluded place of rest and a peculiar tabernacle to cut the integuments of beauty into veils of tears and sorrows? O lovely Jerusalem, they have persuaded thee to this. Therefore their end shall come, and I will lead thee through the wilderness in shadow of my cloud, and in my love I will lead thee, lovely shadow, of sleeping Albion. This is the song of the Lamb sung by slaves in evening time. But Jerusalem faintly saw him closed in the dungeons of Babylon. Her form was held by Beulah's daughters, but all within unseen, she sat at the mills, her hair unbound, her feet naked, cut with the flints, her tears run down. Her reason, grown, grow, her reason grows like the wheel of hand, incessant turning day and night without rest. Insane, she raves upon the wind's horse, inarticulate, all night Vela hears. She triumphs in pride of, ho pride of holiness 
to see Jerusalem deface her lineaments with bitter blows of despair, while the satanic holiness triumphed in valor in a religion of chastity and uncircumcised selfishness, both of the head and heart and loins, closed up in moral pride. But the divine lamb stood beside Jerusalem. Off she saw the lineaments divine, and off the voice heard, and off she said, O Lord and Savior, have the gods of heaven pierced thee, or hast thou been pierced in the house of thy friends? Art thou alive, and livest thou for evermore? Or art thou not, but a delusive shadow, a thought that liveth not? Babel mocks, saying, There is no God, nor Son of God, that thou, O human imagination, O divine body, art all delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill. The stars of Albion cruel rise, thou bindest to sweet influences, for for thou also sufferest with me, although I behold thee not. For thou also sufferest with me, although I behold thee not. And although I sin and blaspheme thy holy name, thou pitiest me, because thou knowest I am deluded by the turning mills, and by these visions of pity and love, because of Albion's death. Thus spake at Jerusalem, and thus the divine voice replied, Mild shade of man, Pitiest thou these visions of terror and woe? Give forth thy pity and love, fear no, and fear not. Give forth thy pity and love, fear not. Lo, I am with thee always. Only believe in me that I have power to raise from the dead thy brother who sleepeth in Albion. Fear not, trembling shade. Behold, in the visions of Elohim, Jehovah, behold, Joseph and Mary, And he comforted, O Jerusalem, in the visions of Jehovah and Elohim. She looked and saw Joseph the carpenter in Nazareth and Mary his espoused wife. And Mary said, If thou put me away from thee, thou dost not murder me? Joseph spoke in anger and fury. Should I marry a harlot and an adulteress? Mary answered, Art thou more pure than thy maker? who forgiveth sins and calls again her that is lost. Though she hates, he calls her again in love. I love my dear Joseph, but he driveth me away from his presence. Yet I hear the voice of God in the voice of my husband. Though he is angry for a moment, he will not utterly cast me away. If I were pure, never could I taste the sweets of the forgiveness of sins. If I were holy, I never could behold the tears of love of him who loves me in the midst of his anger in furnace of fire. Ah, my Mary, said Joseph, weeping over and embracing her closely in his arms, doth he forgive Jerusalem and not exactly pure and not exact purity from her who is polluted? I hear his voice in my sleep and his angel in my dream saying, Doth Jehovah forgive a debt only on condition that it shall be paid? Doth he forgive pollution only on conditions of purity? That debt is not forgiven. That pollution is not forgiven. Such is the forgiveness of the gods, the moral virtues of the heathen, whose tender mercies are cruelty. But Jehovah's salvation is without money and without price in the continual forgiveness of sins, in the perpetual mutual sacrifice in great eternity. For behold, there is none that liveth and sinneth not, and this is the covenant of Jehovah. If you forgive one another, so shall Jehovah forgive you, that he himself may dwell among you. Fear not, then, to take thee to thee, Mary thy wife, for she is with child by the Holy Ghost.
Then Mary burst forth into a song. She flowed like a river of many streams in the arms of Joseph and gave forth her tears of joy like many waters and emanating into gardens and palaces upon Euphrates and to forests and floods and animals wild and tame from Gihon to Heidekel to cornfields and villages and inhabitants upon Pison and Arnon and Jordan and I heard the voice among the reapers saying, Am I Jerusalem the lost adulteress? Or am I Babylon come up to Jerusalem? And another voice answered saying, Does the voice of my Lord call me again? Am I pure through his mercy and pity? Am I become lovely as a virgin in his sight, who am indeed a harlot drunken with the sacrifice of idols? Does he call her pure as he did in the days of her infancy when she was cast out to the loathing of her person? The Chaldean took me from my cradle. The Amalekite stole me away upon his camels before I had ever beheld with love the face of Jehovah or known that there was a God of mercy. O mercy, O divine humanity, O forgiveness and pity and compassion, if I were pure, I should never have known thee. If I were unpolluted, I should never have glorified thy holiness or rejoiced in thy great salvation. Mary leaned her side against Jerusalem. Jerusalem received the infant into her hands in the visions of Jehovah. Times passed on. Jerusalem fainted over the cross and sepulchre, she heard the voice, Wilt thou make Rome thy patriarch druid and the kings of Europe his horsemen? Man in the resurrection changes his sexual garments at will. Every harlot was once a virgin, every criminal an infant love. Repose on me till the morning of the grave. I am thy life. Jerusalem replied, I am an outcast. Albion is dead. I am left to the trampling foot and the spurning heel. A harlot I am called. I am sold from street to street. I am defaced with blows and with the dirt of the prison. And thou wilt become my husband. O oh, my Lord and Savior, shall valor bring thee forth? Uh, shall the chaste be ashamed also? I see the maternal line. I see the seed of the woman. Cana and Ada and Zillah and Nama, wife of Noah, Shua's daughter and Tamar and Rahab the Canaanites, Ruth the Maobite and Bathsheba of the daughters of Heath, Nama the Ammonite, Zibia the Philistine, and Mary. These are the daughters of Vela, mother of the body of death. But I, thy Magdalene, behold thy spiritual risen body. Shall Albion arise? I know he shall arise at the last day. I know that in my flesh I shall see God. But emanations are weak. They know not whence they are nor whither tend. Jesus replied, I am the resurrection and the life. I die and pass the limits of possibility as it appears to individual perception. Luva must be created and Vala, for I cannot leave them in the gnawing grave, <clears throat> but will prepare a way for my banished ones to return. Come now with me into the villages, walk through all the cities, Though thou art taken to prison in judgment, starved in the streets, I will command the cloud to give thee food and the hard rock to flow with milk and wine. Though thou seest me not a season, even a long season and a hard journey and a howling wilderness. Though Vela's cloud hide thee and Luva's fires follow thee, only believe and trust in me, lo, I am always with thee. So spoke the Lamb of God, while Luva's cloud reddening above, 
burst forth in streams of blood upon the heaven and dark night, involved Jerusalem, and the wheels of Albion's sons turned hoarse over the mountains, and the fires blazed on druid altars, on the sun set in Tyburn's brook, where victims howl and cry. But Los beheld the divine vision among the flames of the furnaces. Therefore he lived and breathed in hope, but his tears fell incessant because his children were closed from him apart, and Enitharmon dividing in fierce pain. Also the vision of God was closed in clouds. Uh, the Albion's specters that Los in despair oft sat and oft pondered, on death eternal in fierce shudders upon the mountains of Albion, walking and in the vales and howling fierce, then to his anvils turning anew began his labors, though in terrible pains. Jehovah stood among the Druids in the valley of Annandale, when the four Zoas of Albion, the four living creatures, the cherubim of Albion, tremble before the spectre, in the starry harness of the plough of nations, and their names are Urizen and Luva and Tharmas and Erthona. Luva slew Tharmas, the angel of the tongue, and Albion brought him to justice in his own city of Paris, denying the resurrection. Then Vala, the wife of Albion, who is the daughter of Luva, took vengeance twi twelvefold among the chaotic rocks of the Druids, where the human victims howled to the moon and Thor and Frigga, danced the dance of death contending with Jehovah among the cherubim. The chariot wheels filled with eyes rage along the howling valley in the dividing of Reuben and Benjamin bleeding from Chester's river. The giants and the witches and the ghosts of Albion dance with Thor and Frigga, and the fairies lead the moon along the valley of Cherubim, bleeding in torrents from mountain to mountain, a lovely victim. And Jehovah stood in the gates of the victim, and he appeared, a weeping infant, in the gates of birth, in the midst of heaven. The cities and villages of Albion became rock and sand, unhumanized. The druid sons of Albion and the heavens a void around unfathomable. No human form, but sexual, and a little weeping infant, pale, reflected multitudinous in the looking glass of Enitharmon. On all sides, around in the clouds of the female, on Albion's cliffs of the dead. Such the appearance in Cheviot, in the divisions of Reuben. When the cherubim hid their heads under their wings in deep slumbers, when the druids demanded chastity from woman, and all was lost. How can the female be chaste, O thou stupid druid? cried Los, without the forgiveness of sins in the merciful clouds of Jehovah, and without the baptism of repentance to wash away calumnies and the accusations of sin that each may be pure in their neighbor's sight. O oh, when shall Jehovah give us victims from his flocks and herds instead of victims, human victims by the daughters of Albion and Canaan? Then laughed Gwendolyn and her laughter shook the nations and families of the dead beneath Beulah, from Tyburn to Golgotha, and from Ireland to Japan. Further her lions and tigers and wolves sport before Los on the Thames and Medway. London and Canterbury groan in pain. Los knew not yet what was done. He thought it was all in a vision, in visions of the dreams of Beulah among the daughters of Albion. Therefore the murder was put apart in the looking glass of Enitharmon. He saw in Vala's hand the druid knife of revenge and the poison cup of jealousy, and thought of it a poetic vision of the atmospheres, till Canaan rolled apart from Albion across the Rhine, along the Danube, 
and all the land of Canaan suspended over the valley of Sheviot, from Bashan to Tyre and from Troy to Gaza of the Am- Amalekite. And Reuben fled with his head downwards among the caverns of the mundane shell, which froze on all sides round Canaan, on the vast expanse where the daughters of Albion weave the web of ages and generations, folding and unfolding it like a veil of cherubim. And sometimes it touches the earth's summits, and sometimes it spreads abroad into the indefinite specter who is the rational power. Then all the daughters of Albion become one before Los, even Vala, and she put forth her hand upon the looms in dreadful howlings till she vegetated into a hungry stomach and a devouring tongue. Her hand is a court of justice, her feet two armies in battle, storms and pestilence, in her locks and in her loins earthquake and fire, and in the ruins of cities and nations and families and tongues, she cries, the human is but a worm, and thou, O male, thou art thyself female, a male, a breeder of seed, a son and a husband, and lo, the human divine is woman's shadow, a vapor in the summer's heat. Go assume papal dignity, thou spectre, thou male harlot, Arthur divided into the kings of Europe in times remote. O woman born, and woman nourished, and woman educated, and woman scorned. Wherefore art thou living, said Los, and man cannot live in thy presence? Art thou Vala, the wife of Albion, O thou lovely daughter of Luva? All quarrels arise from reasoning, the secret murder, and the violent manslaughter. These are the specter's double cave, the sexual death living on accusation of sin and judgment, to freeze love and innocence into the gold and silver of the merchant without forgiveness of sin. Love is itself eternal death. Then the spectre drew valor into his bosom, magnificent, terrific, glittering with precious stones and gold, with garments of blood and fire. He wept in deadly wrath of the spectre, in self-contradicting agony, crimson with wrath and green with jealousy, dazzling with love and jealousy enmingled, and the purple of the violet darkened deep over the plough of nations thundering in the hand of Albion's spectre. A dark hermaphrodite, they stood frowning upon London's river and the distaff and spindle in the hands of Vala with the flax of human miseries turned fierce with the lives of men along the valley as Reuben fled before the daughters of Albion taxing the nations. Derby Peak yawned a horrid chasm at the cries of Gwendolyn and at the stamping feet of Regan upon the flaming treadles of her loom that dropped with crimson gore with the loves of Albion and Canaan opening along the valley of Rephaim, weaving over the caves of Machpelah to decide two worlds with a great decision, a world of mercy and a world of justice, the world of mercy for salvation, <clears throat> to cast Luva into the wrath and Albion into the pity in the two contraries of humanity and in the four regions. For in the depths of Albion's bosom in the eastern heaven, they sound the clarion strong, they chain the howling captives. <clears throat> They cast the lots into the helmet. They give the oath of blood in Lambeth. They vote the death of Luva and nailed him to Albion's tree in Bath. They stand him with poisonous blue. They enwove him in cruel roots to die a death six thousand years bound round with vegetation. The sun was black and the moon rolled a useless globe through Britain. 
Then left the sons of Urzen, the plough and harrow, the loom, the hammer and the chisel, and the rule and compasses. From London fleeing, they forged the sword on Cheviot, the chariot of war and battle axe, the trumpet fiddled to mortal battle, and the flute of summer and Annandale. And all the arts of life they changed into the arts of death in Albion. The hourglass condemned because its simple workmanship was like the workmanship of the plowman and the water wheel that raises water into cisterns broken and burned with fire because its workmanship was like the workmanship of the shepherd and in their stead intricate wheels invented wheel without wheel to perplex youth in their outgoings and to bind to labors in Albion of day and night, the myriads of eternity, that they may grind and polish brass and iron hour after hour, laborious task, kept ignorant of its use, that they may spend the days of wisdom in sorrowful drudgery to obtain a scanty pittance of bread, in ignorance to view a small portion and think that all, and call it demonstration, blind to all the simple rules of life. Now, now the battle rages round thy tender limbs, O Vala. Now smile strong among thy bitter tears. Now put on all thy beauty. Is not the wound of the sword sweet, <clears throat> and the broken bone delightful? Wilt thou now smile among thy scythes when the wounded groan in the field? We were carried when the wounded groan in the field. We were carried away in thousands from London and in tens of thousands from Westminster and Marybone in ships closed up, chained hand and foot, compelled to fight under the iron whips of our captains, fearing our officers more than the enemy. Lift up thy blue eyes, Vala, and put on thy sapphire shoes. O oh, melancholy Magdalen, behold the morning over Malden break. Gird on thy flaming zone, descend into the sepulchre of Canterbury. Scatter the blood from thy golden brow, the tears from thy silver locks. Shake off the waters from thy wings, and the dust from thy white garments. Remember all thy feigned terrors on the secret couch of Lambeth's Vale, when the sun rose in the glowing morn, with the eyes of my arms of mighty hosts marching to battle, who was wont to rise with Urizen's harps, girt as a sower with his seed to scatter life abroad over Albion. Arise, O Vala, bring the bow of Urizen, bring the swift arrows of light. How raged the golden horses of Urizen, compelled to the chariot of love, compelled to leave the plow to the ox, to snuff up the winds of desolation, to trample the cornfields in boastful neighings. This is no gentle harp, this is no warbling brook, nor shadow of myrtle tree but blood and wounds and dismal cries and shadows of the oak and hearts laid open to the light by the grisly broad grisly sword and bowels hid in hammered steel ripped quivering on the ground call forth thy smiles of soft deceit call forth thy cloudy tears we hear thy sighs and trumpet shrill when morn shall blood renew so sang the spectre sons of Albion round Luva's st stone of trial, mocking and deriding all the writhings of their victim on Salisbury, drinking his emanation in intoxicating bliss, rejoicing in giant dance, for a spectre has no emanation but what he imbibes from deceiving a victim. Then he becomes her priest, and she his tabernacle and his oak grove till the victim rend the woven veil in the end of his sleep when Jesus calls him from his grave. So sang the spectre sons of Albion round Luva's stone of trial, mocking and deriding at the writhings of their victim on Salisbury, 
drinking his emanation in intoxicating bliss, rejoicing in giant dance, for a specter has no emanation but what he imbibes from deceiving a victim. Then he becomes her priest, and she his tabernacle and his oak grove, till the victim rend the woven veil and the and in the end of sleep, when Jesus calls him from his grave. Howling, the victims on the druid altars yield their souls to the stern warriors. Lovely sport, the daughters round their victims, drinking their lives in sweet intoxication. Hence arose from bath, soft deluding odors and spiral volutions intricately winding over Albion's mountains, a feminine indefinite cruel delusion. Astonished, terrified, and in pain and torment, sudden they behold their own parent, the emanation of their murdered enemy, become their emanation and their temple and tabernacle. They knew not this Vala was their beloved mother, Vala, Albion's wife. Terrified at the sight of the victim, at his distorted sinews, the trembling of Vala vibrate through the limbs of Albion's sons, while they rejoice over Luva in mockery and bitter scorn. Suddenly they become like what they behold in howlings and deadly pain. Spasms smite their features, sinews and limbs. Pale, they look on one another. They turn, contorted, their iron necks bend unwilling toward Luva. Their lips tremble, their muscular fibers are cramped and smitten. They become like what they behold, yet immense in strength and power. In awful pomp and gold, in all the precious unhewn stones of Eden, they build a stupendous building on the plain of Salisbury, with chains of rock round London stone, <clears throat> of reasonings, of unhewn demonstrations, in labyrinthine arches, mighty yours and architect, through which the heavens might revolve and eternity be bound in their chain, labor unparalleled, a wondrous rocky world of cruel destiny, rocks piled on rocks, reaching the stars, stretching from pole to pole. The building is natural religion and its altars natural morality, a building of eternal death whose proportions are eternal despair. Here Vala stood turning the iron spindle of destruction from heaven to earth, howling, invisible, but not invisible, her two covering cherubs, afterwards named Voltaire and Rousseau, two frowning rocks on each side of the cove and stone of torture, frozen sons of the feminine tabernacle of Bacon, Newton, and Locke. For Luva is France, the victim of the specters of Albion. Los beheld in terror, he poured his loud storms upon the, on the furnaces. The daughters of Albion, clothed in garments of needlework, stripped them off their shoulders and bosoms. They lay aside their garments. They sit naked upon the stone of trial. The knife of flint passes over the howling victim. His blood gushes and stains the fair side of the fair daughters of Albion. They put aside his curls. They divide his seven locks upon his forehead. They bind his forehead with thorns of iron. They put into his hand a reed. They mock, saying, Behold, the king of Canaan, who art seven hundred chariots of iron. They take off his vesture, whole with their knives of flint but they cut asunder his inner garments, searching with their cruel fingers for his heart. And there they enter in pomp, in many tears, and there they erect a temple and an altar. They pour cold water on his brain in front to cause lids to grow over his eyes in veils of tears and caverns to freeze over his nostrils. While they feed his tongue from cups and dishes of painted clay. Gro glowing with beauty and cruelty, they obscure the sun and the moon. No eye can look upon them.
Ah, alas, at the sight of the victim and at the sight of those who are smitten, all who see become what they behold. Their eyes are covered with veils of tears and their nostrils and tongues shrunk up. Their ears bent outward as their victim, so are they in the pangs of unconquerable fear. Amidst delights of revenge, earth shaking, and as their eye and ear shrunk, the heavens shrunk away. The divine vision became first a burning flame, then a column of fire, then an awful fiery wheel surrounding earth and heaven, and then a globe of blood wandering distant in an unknown night. Afar in the unknown night, the mountains fled away. Six months of morality, mortality, six months of mortality, a summer and six months of mortality, a winter. The human form began to be altered by the daughters of Albion and the perceptions to be dissipated into the indefinite. Becoming a mighty polypus named Albion's tree, they tie the veins and nerves into knots and the seed into a double knot. They look forth, the sun is shrunk, the heavens are shrunk, away, the heavens are shrunk away into the far remote and the trees and mountains withered into indefinite cloudy shadows in darkness and separation by invisible hatreds adjoined. They seem remote and separate from each other, and yet are a mighty polypus in the deep. As mistletoe grows on an oak, so Albion's tree on eternity, lo, he who will not commingle in love must be adjoined by hate. They look forth from Stonehenge, from the cove round London stone. They look on one another. The mountain calls out to the mountain. Plinlimon shrunk away, Snowdon trembled. The mountains of Wales and Scotland beheld the descending war, the routed flying. Red run the streams of Albion. Thames is drunk with blood, as Gwendolen cast the shuttle of war, as Campbell returned the beam. The Humber and the Seven are drunk with the blood of the slain. London feels his brain cut round. Edinburgh's heart is circumscribed. York and Lincoln hide among the flocks because of the grinding, grinding knife. Worcester and Hereford, Oxford and Cambridge reel and stagger. Overwearied with howling, Wales and Scotland alone sustain the fight. The inhabitants are sick to death. They labor to divide into days and nights, the uncertain periods, and into weeks and months. In vain they send the dove and raven, and in vain the serpent over the mountains, and in vain the eagle and lion over the fourfold wilderness. They return not, but generate in rocky places desolate. They return not, but build a habitation separate from man. The sun forgets his course like a drunken man. He hesitates upon the Chelsden Hills, thinking to sleep on the Severn in vain. He is hurried afar into an unknown night. He bleeds in torrents of blood as he rolls through heaven above. He chokes up the paths of the sky. The moon is leprous as snow, trembling and descending down, seeking to rest upon high Mona, scattering her leprous snows in flakes of disease over Albion. The stars flee remote. The heaven is iron, the earth is sulphur, and all the mountains and hills shrink up like a withering gourd as the senses of men shrink together under the knife of flint in the hands of Albion's daughters among the druid temples by those who drink their blood and the blood of their covenant. The sun forgets his course like a drunken man. He hesitates upon the Chelsden Hills, thinking to sleep on the Severn in vain. He is hurried afar into an unknown night. He bleeds in torrents of blood as he rolls through heaven above. He chokes up the paths of the sky. The moon is leprous as snow, trembling and descending down, seeking to rest upon high Mona. 
scattering her leprous snows in flakes of disease over Albion. The stars flee remote, the heaven is iron, the earth is sulphur, and all the mountains and hills shrink up like the wither a withering gourd, and the senses of man shrink together under the knife of flint in the hands of Albion's daughters among the druid temples by those who drink their blood and the blood of their covenant. And the twelve daughters of Albion united in Rahab and Terza, a double female, and they drew out from the rocky stones fibers of life to weave for every female, <coughs> fibers of life to weave, for every female is a golden loom. The rocks are opaque hardness covering all vegetated things. And as they wove and cut from the looms in various divisions, stretching over Europe and Asia from Ireland to Japan, they divided into many lovely daughters to be counterparts to those they wove. For when they wove a male, they divided into a female to the woven male. In opaque hardness, they cut the fibers from the rocks. Groaning in pain, they weave, calling the rocks atomic origins of existence, denying eternity by the atheistical Epicurean philosophy of Albion's tree. Such are the feminine and masculine when separated from man. They call the rocks parents of men and adore the frowning chaos, dancing around in howling pain, clothed in the bloody veil, hiding Albion's sons within the veil, closing Jerusalem's sons without, to feed with their souls the specters of Albion, ashamed to give love openly to the piteous and merciful man, counting him an imbecile mockery, but the warrior they adore and his revenge cherish with the blood of the innocent. They drink up Dan and Gad to feed with milk Schofield and Cotope, strip off Joseph's coat and dip it in the blood of battle. Terza sits weeping to hear the shrieks of the dying. Her knife of flint is in her hand. She passes it over the howling victim. The daughters weave their work in loud cries over the rock of Horeb, still eyeing Albion's cliffs, eagerly seizing and twisting the threads of Vala and Jerusalem, running from mountain to mountain over the whole earth. Loud the warriors rage in Beth Peor, beneath the iron whips of their captains and consecrated banners. Loud the sun and moon rage in the conflict. Loud the stars shout in the night battle and their spears grow to their hands with blood, weaving the deaths of the mighty into a tabernacle for Rahab and Terza till the great polypus of generation covered the earth. In Verulam, the polypus's head winding around his bulk through Rochester and Churchester and Exeter and Salisbury to Bristol, and his heart beat strong on Salisbury Plain, shooting out fibers round the earth through Gaul and Italy and Greece and along the Sea of Rephium into Judea to Sodom and Gomorrah, thence to India, China and Japan. The twelve daughters in Rahab and Terza have circumscribed the brain beneath and pierced it through the midst with a golden pin. Blood hath stained her fair side beneath her bosom. O oh, thou poor human form, she said, O oh, thou poor child of woe, why wilt thou wander away from Terza? Why me compelled to bind thee? If thou dost go away from me, I shall consume upon these rocks these fibers of thine eyes that used to beam in distant heavens away from me. I have bound down with a hot iron these nostrils that expanded with delight in morning skies. I have bent downward with lead melted in my roaring furnaces of affliction, of love, of sweet despair, of torment unendurable. My soul is seven furnaces, incessant roars the bellows upon my terribly flaming heart. 
The molten metal runs and channels through my fiery limbs. O oh, love, O oh, pity, O oh, fear, O oh, pain. The pangs, the bitter pangs of love forsaken. Ephraim was a wilderness of joy where all my wild beasts ran. The river Cana wandered by my street, sweet Manasseh's side, to see the boy spring into heaven sounding from my sight. Go, Noah, fetch the girdle of strong brass, heat it red hot, press it round the loins of this ever-expanding cruelty. Shriek not, so my only love, I refuse thy joys. I drink I sh thy shrieks, because hand and hyal are cruel and obdurate to me. O Schofield, why art thou cruel? Lo, Joseph is thine, to make you one, to weave you both in the same mantle of skin. Bind him down, sisters, bind him down on Ebal, mount of cursing. Mala, come forth from Lebanon, and Hogla from Mount Sinai. Come, circumscribe this tongue of sweets, and with a screw of iron, fasten this ear into the rock. Micah, the task is thine. Weep not so, sisters, weep not so. Our life depends on this, or mercy and truth are fled away from Sechem and Mount Gilead, unless my beloved is bound upon the stems of vegetation. And thus the warriors cry in the hot day of victory in songs. Look, the beautiful daughter of Albion sits naked upon the stone, her panting victim beside her, her heart is drunk with blood, though her brain is not drunk with wine. She goes forth from Albion in pride of beauty, in cruelty of holiness, in the brightness of her tabernacle and her ark and secret place. The beautiful daughter of Albion delights the eyes of the kings. Their hearts and the hearts of their warriors glow hot before Thor and Frigga. O Moloch, O Chemosh, O Bacchus, O Venus, O oh, double god of generation, the heavens are cut like a mantle around from the cliffs of Albion, across Europe, across Africa, in howlings and deadly war. A sheet and veil and curtain of blood is let down from heaven across the hills of Ephraim and down Mount Olivet to the valley of Jebusit. Moloch rejoices in heaven. He sees the twelve daughters naked upon the twelve stones, themselves condensing to rocks and into the ribs of a man. Lo, they shoot forth in tender nerves across Europe and Asia. Lo, they rest upon the tribes where their panting victims lie. Moloch rushes into the kings in love to the beautiful daughters, but they frown and delight in cruelty, refusing all other joy. Bring your offerings, your first begotten, pampered with milk and blood, your firstborn of seven years old, be they males or females, to the daughters, to the beautiful daughters of Albion. They sport before the kings, clothed in the skin of the victim. Blood, human blood, is the life and delightful food of the warrior, the well-fed warrior's flesh of him who is slain in war, fills the valleys of Ephraim with breeding women walking in pride and bringing forth under green trees with pleasure, without pain, for their food is the blood of the captive. Moloch rejoices through the land from Havilah to Shur. He rejoices in moral law and its severe penalties. Loud Shaddai and Jehovah thunder above when they see the twelve panting victims on the twelve stones of power and the beautiful daughters of Albion. <clears throat> if you dare rend their veil with your spear, you are healed of love. From the hills of Camberwell and Wimbledon, from the valleys of Walton and Escher, from Stonehenge and from Malden's Cove, Jerusalem's pillars fall in the rendings of fierce war over France and Germany. Upon the Rhine and Danube, Reuben and Benjamin flee. They hide in the valley of Rephaim. Why trembles the warrior's limbs when he beholds thy beauty, spotted with victim's blood, by the fires of thy secret tabernacle and thy ark and holy place? At thy frowns, at thy dire revenge, smitten as Uzzah of old, 
His armor is softened, his spear and sword faint in his hand, from Albion ac across great Tartary. O beautiful daughter of Albion, cruelty is thy delight, O virgin of terrible eyes, who dwellst by valleys of springs, beneath the mountains of Lebanon, in the city of Rehob in Hamath, taught to touch the harp, to dance in the circle of warriors before the kings of Canaan, to cut the flesh from the victim, to roast the flesh in the fire, to examine the infant's limbs in cruelties of holiness, to refuse the joys of love, to bring the spies from Egypt, to raise jealousy in the bosom of the twelve kings of Canaan, and then to let the spies depart to Meribah Kadesh, to the place of the Amalekite. I am drunk with unsatiated love. I must rage again to war, for the virgin has frowned and refused. <clears throat> sometimes I curse and sometimes bless thy fascinating beauty. Once man was occupied in intellectual pleasures and energies, but now my soul is harrowed with grief and fear and love and desire, and now I hate and now I love. Intellect is no more. There is no time for anything but the torments of love and desire. The feminine and masculine shadows soft, mild and ever varying in beauty, are shadows no more, but rocks in Horeb. Then all the males combined into one male, and every one became a ravening, eating cancer growing in the female, a polypus of roots of reasoning, doubt, despair, and death, going forth and returning from Albion's rocks to Canaan, devouring Jerusalem from every nation on the earth. Envying stood the enormous form at variance with itself in all its members, in eternal torment of love and jealousy, driven forth by Los time after time from Albion's cliffy shore, drawing the free loves of Jerusalem into infernal bondage, that they might be born in contentions of chastity and in deadly hate between Leah and Rachel, daughters of deceit and fraud, bearing the images of various species of contention and jealousy and abhorrence and revenge and deadly murder, till they refuse liberty to the male, and not like Beulah, where every female delights to give her maiden to her husband. The female searches sea and land for gratifications to the male genius, who in return clothes her in gems and gold and feeds her with the food of Eden, hence all her beauty beams. She creates at her will a little moony night and silence with spaces of sweet gardens and a tent of elegant beauty, closed in by a sandy desert and a night of stars shining and a little tender moon and a hovering angels on the wing and the male gives a time and revolution to her space till the time of love is past in ever varying delights. For all things exist in the human imagination and thence in Beulah they are stolen by secret amorous theft till they have had severe, had enough punishment enough to make them commit crimes. Hence rose the tabernacle in the wilderness and all its offerings for male and female loves in Beulah and their jealousies. But no one can consummate female bliss in Los's world without becoming a generated mortal, a vegetating death. And now the specters of the dead awaken Beulah. All the jealousies become murderous, uniting together in Rahab, a religion of chastity, forming a commerce to sell loves with moral law, an equal balance not going down with decision. Therefore the male severe and cruel, filled with stern revenge, mutual hate returns and mutual deceit and mutual fear. Hence the infernal veil grows in the disobedient female, which Jesus rends and the whole druid law removes away from the inner sanctuary. A false holiness hid within the center, 
for the sanctuary of Eden is in the camp in the outline, in the circumference, and the every minute particular is holy, embraces our commingling's from the head even to the feet, and not a pompous high priest entering by a secret place. Jerusalem pined in her inmost soul over wandering Reuben as she slept in Beulah's night, hid by the daughters of Beulah. And this the form of mighty hand sitting on Albion's cliffs, before the face of Albion, a mighty threatening form, his bosom wide and shoulders huge, overspreading wondrous, bear three strong sinewy necks and three awful and terrible heads, three brains in contradictory counsel brooding incessantly, neither daring to put in act its counsels, fearing each other, therefore rejecting ideas as nothing and holding all wisdom to consist in the agreements and disagreements of ideas, plotting to devour Albion's body of humanity and love. Such form the aggregate of the twelve sons of Albion took, and such their appearance when combined, but often by birth pangs and loud groans, they divide to twelve, the key bones and the chest dividing in pain, disclose a hideous orifice, thence Issuing, the giant brood arise as the smoke of the furnace, shaking the rocks from sea to sea. And there they combine into three forms named Bacon, Newton, and Locke in the oak groves of Albion, which overspread all the earth. Imputing sin and righteousness to individuals, Rahab sat deep within him hid, his feminine power revealed, brooding abstract philosophy to destroy imagination, the divine humanity, a threefold wonder, feminine most beauty, three most beautiful, threefold, each within the other, on her white marble and even neck, her heart enorbed and bonafide with locks of shadowing modesty, shining over her beautiful female features, soft flourishing in beauty, beams mild, all love and all perfection, that when the lips receive a kiss from gods or men, a threefold kiss returns from the pressed loveliness, so her whole immortal form threefold, threefold embrace returns, consuming lives of God and men in fires of beauty, melting them as gold and silver in the furnace, her brain in labyrinths, the whole heaven of her bosom and loins, to put in act what her heart wills. Oh, who can withstand her power? Her name is Vala in eternity. In time, her name is Rahab. The starry heavens all were fled from the mighty limbs of Albion. And Albion's land was seen, the heavenly Canaan, and the substance, as the substance is to the shadow, and above Albion's twelve sons, were seen Jerusalem's sons, and the twelve tribes spreading over Albion, as the soul is to the body, so Jerusalem's sons are to the sons of Albion. And Jerusalem is Albion's emanation. What is above is within, for everything in eternity is translucent. The circumference is within. Without is formed the selfish center, and the circumference still expands, going forward to eternity, and the center has eternal states, these states we now explore. And these names of daughters Albion's twelve sons, these the names of Albion's twelve sons, and of his twelve daughters, with their districts. Hand dwelt in Selsey, and had Sussex and Surrey, and Kent and Middlesex, and all their rivers and their hills of flocks and herds, their villages, towns, cities, seaports, temples, sublime cathedrals. All were his friends, and their sons and daughters intermarry in Beulah, for all are men in eternity. Rivers, mountains, cities, villages, all are human, and when you enter into their bosoms, you walk in heavens and earths, 
as you in your own bosom, you bear your heaven and earth, and all you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Heil dwelt in Winchester, comprehending Hans, Dorset, Devon, Cornwall, their villages, cities, seaports, their cornfields and gardens spacious, palaces, rivers and mountains, and between Hand and Heil arose Gwendolyn and Campbell, who is Bodacia. They go abroad and return like lovely beams of light from the mingled affections of the brothers. The inhabitants of the whole earth rejoice in their beautiful light. Coben dwelt in Bath, Somerset, Wiltshire, and Gloucestershire obeyed his awful voice. Ignoge, his lovely emanation, she adjoined with Guantoc's children. Soon lovely Cordella arose. Guantoc forgave and joyed over South Wales and all its mountains. Peachy had North Wales, Shropshire, Cheshire, and the Isle of Man. His emanation is mehedible terrible and lovely upon the mountains. Brereton had Yorkshire, Durham, Westmoreland, and his emanation is Regan. She adjoined to Slade and produced Goneril far beaming. Slade had Lincoln, Stafford, Derby, Nottingham, and his lovely emanation Goneril rejoices over hills and rocks and woods and rivers. Hutton had Warwick, Northampton, Bedford, Buckingham, Leicester, and Berkshire, and his emanation is Gwynefred the Beautiful. Schofield had Eli, Rutland, Cambridge, Huntingdon, Norfolk, Suffolk, Hartford, and Essex, and his em emanation is Guinevere, beautiful. She beams toward the east all kinds of precious stones and pearl with instruments of music in holy Jerusalem. Cox had Oxford, Warwick, Wilts. His emanation is Estrild. Joined with Cordella, she shines southward over the Atlantic. Cotip had Hereford, Stafford, Worcester, and his emanation is Sabrina, joined with Mehetabal. She shines west over America. Bowen had all Scotland, the Isles, Northumberland, and Cumberland. His emanation is Conwenna. She shines a triple form over the north with pearly beams, gorgeous and terrible. Jerusalem and Vala rejoice in Bowen and Conwenna. But the four sons of Jerusalem that never were generated are Rintra and Palambron and Theotormen and Bromion. They dwell over the four provinces of Ireland in heavenly light the four universities of Scotland in Oxford and Cambridge and Winchester. But now Albion is darkened and Jerusalem lies in ruins of the mountains of Albion above the head of Los. And Los shouted with ceaseless shoutings and his tears poured down his immortal cheeks, rearing his hands to heaven for divine aid. But he spoke not to Albion, fearing lest Albion should turn his back against the divine vision and fall over the precipice of eternal death. But he receded before Albion and before Vala, weaving the veil with the iron shuttle of war among the rooted oaks of Albion, weeping and shouting to the Lord day and night, and his children wept round him as a flock silent seven days of eternity. And the 32 counties of the four provinces of Ireland are thus divided. The four counties are in the four camps, Munster south in Rubensgate, Connaught west in Josephsgate, Ulster north in Dansgate, Leinster east in Judasgate. For Albion, the eternity has 16 gates among his pillars. But the four toward the west were walled up, and the twelve that front the four other points were turned four square by Los for Jerusalem's sake, and called the gates of Jerusalem, because twelve sons Jerusalem fled successive through the gates. But the four sons of Jerusalem, 
who fled not, but remained, are Rintra and Palambron and Theotormen and Bromion. The four that remain with Los to guard the western wall, and these four remain to guard the four walls of Jerusalem, whose foundations remain in the thirty-two counties of Ireland, and in twelve counties of Wales, and in the forty counties of England, and in the thirty-six counties of Scotland. And the names of the thirty-two counties of Ireland are these under Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, Arlaoth, Longford, Eastmeath, Westmeath, Dumbelin, Kildare, Kings County, Queens County, Wicklow, Catherloff, Wexford, Kilkenny, and those under Reuben and Simon and Levy are these Waterford, Tipperary, Cork, Limerick, Kerry, Clare, and under those Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin are these Galway, Rosecommon, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim, and those under Dan, Asher, and Naphtali are these Donegal, Antrim, Tyrone, Fermina, Arma, Londonderry, Down, Managa, Cabin. These are the land of Aaron. All these center in London and in Golganusa, from whence they are created continually east and west and north and south. And from them are all are created all the nations of the earth, Europe and Asia and Africa and America, in fury fourfold. And thirty-two of the na thirty-two nations to dwell in Jerusalem's gates. O come, ye nations! Come, ye people! Come up to Jerusalem! Return, Jerusalem, and dwell together as of old. Return, return, O Albion, let Jerusalem overspread all nations as in the times of old. O Albion, awake, Reuben wanders, the nations wait for Jerusalem, they look up for the bride. France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Poland, Russia, Sweden, Turkey, Arabia, Palestine, Persia, Hindustan, China, Tartary, Siberia, Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, Guinea, Kafraria, Negroland, Morocco, Congo, Zara, Canada, Greenland, Carolina, Mexico, Peru, Patagonia, Amazonia, Brazil. Thirty-two nations, and under these thirty-two classes of islands in the ocean, all the nations, peoples, and tongues throughout all the earth. And the four gates of Los surround the universe within and without, and whatever is visible in the vegetable earth, the same is visible in the mundane shell, reversed in mountain and vale, and a son of Eden was set over each daughter of Beulah to guard in Albion's tomb the wondrous creation, and the fourfold gate toward Beulah is to the south. Fenelon, Guayan, Teresa, Whitefield, and Hervey guard that gate with all the gentle souls who guide the great winepress of love. Four precious stones, that gate. Such are Cathedron's golden halls in the city of Golganusa, and Los's furnaces howl loud, living, self-moving, lamenting with fury and despair. And they stretch from south to north through all the four points. Lo, the labors of the furnaces Rintra and Palambron, Theotormen and Bromion, loud laboring with the innumerable multitudes of Golganusa, round the anvils of death. But how they came forth from the furnaces, and how long, vast, and severe the anguish ere they knew their father, where long to tell of the iron and of the iron rolled rollers, golden axle trees and yokes of brass, iron chains and braces, and the gold, silver, and brass mingled or separate. For swords, arrows, cannons, mortars, the terrible ball, the wedge, the loud-sounding hammer of destruction, the sounding flail to thresh, 
the winnow, to winnow kingdoms, the water wheel and mill of many innumerable wheels resistless over the fourfold monarchy from earth to the mundane shell. Perusing Albion's tomb in the starry characters of Og and Anak, to create the lion and wolf, the bear, the tiger and ounce, to create the woolly lamb and downy fowl and scaly serpent, the summer and winter, day and night, the sun and moon and stars, the tree, the plant, the flower, the rock, the stone, the metal of vegetative nature, by their hard, restricting condensations. Where Luva's world of opaqueness grew to a period, it became a limit, a rocky hardness without form and void, accumulating without end. Here Los, who is of the Elohim, opens the furnaces of affliction in the emanation, fixing the sexual into an ever prolific generation, naming the limit of opaqueness Satan and the limit of contraction Adam, who is Peleg and Yochan and Esau and Jacob and Saul and David. Voltaire insinuates that these limits are the cruel work of God, make, mocking the remover of limits and the resurrection of the dead, setting up kings in wrath, in holiness of natural religion, which Los with his mighty hammer demolishes time on time in miracles and wonders of the fourfold desert of Albion, permanently created to be in time revealed and demolished Satan, Cain, Tubal, Nimrod, Pharaoh, Priam, Blauded, Belin, Arthur, Alfred, the Norman conqueror, Richard, John, and all the kings and nobles of the earth and all their glories. These are created by Rahab and Terza and Oro, but around these, to preserve them from eternal death, Los creates Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David, Ezekiel, dissipating the rocky forms of death by his thunderous hammer. As the pilgrim passes while the country permanent remains, so men pass on, but states remain permanent forever. The specters of the dead howl round the porches of Los in the terrible family feuds of Albion cities and villages, to devour the body of Albion, hungering and thirsting and ravening. The sons of Los clothe themselves and feed and provide houses and gardens, and every human vegetated form in its inward recesses is a house of pleasantness and a garden of delight, built by the sons and daughters of Los in Baulua, Baulahula, and in Cathedron, sons and daughters of Los, in Baulahula and in Cathedron. From London to York and Edinburgh, the furnaces rage terrible. Primrose Hill is the mouth of the furnace and the iron door. The four Zoas clouded rage. Urizen stood by Albion with Rintra and Palambron and Theotormen and Bromion. These four are Verulam and London and York and Edinburgh, and the four Zoas are Urizen and Luva and Tharmas and Arthona, in opposition deadly, and their wheels in poisonous and deadly stupor turned against each other, loud and fierce, entering into the reasoning power, forsaking imagination, they became spectres and their human bodies were reposed in Beulah by the daughters of Beulah with tears and lamentations. The spectre is the reasoning power in man, and when separated from imagination and closing itself as in steel in a ratio of the things of memory, it thence frames laws and moralities to destroy imagination, 
the divine body by martyrdoms and wars. Teach me, O Holy Spirit, the testimony of Jesus. Let me comprehend wondrous things out of the divine law. I behold Babylon in the opening streets of London. I behold Jerusalem in ruins wandering about from house to house. This I behold, the shudderings of death attend my steps. I walk up and down in six thousand years. Their events are before me, to tell how Los and grief and anger, whirling round his hammer on present high, drave the sons and daughters of Albion from their ancient mountains. They became the twelve gods of Asia opposing the divine vision. The sons of Albion are twelve, the sons of Jerusalem sixteen. I tell how Albion's sons, by harmonies of concords and discords, opposed to melody, and by lights and shades opposed to outline, and by abstraction opposed to the visions of imagination, by cruel laws divided sixteen into twelve divisions. How high all roofed Los and Albion's cliffs, by the affections rent asunder and opposed to thought. By cruel laws divided into twelve divisions, how high all roofed Los and Albion's cliffs, by the affections rent asunder and opposed to thought, to draw Jerusalem's sons into the vortex of his wheels. Therefore Hyle is called Gog, age after age, drawing them away toward Babylon. Babylon, the rational morality, deluding to death the little ones in strong temptations of stolen beauty. I tell how Reuben slept on London stone, and the daughters of Albion ran around admiring his awful beauty. With moral virtue, the fair deceiver, offspring of good and evil, they divided him in love upon the Thames and sent him over Europe in streams of gore out of Cathedron's looms. How Los drave them from Albion, and they became the daughters of Canaan. Hence Albion was called the Canaanite and all his sons. Hence is my theme. O oh, my Lord, my Savior, open thou thy gates, and I will lead forth thy words, telling how the daughters cut the fibers of Reuben, how he rolled apart and took root in Bashan. Terror struck Albion's sons, look toward Bashan. They have divided Simon. He also rolled apart in blood, over the nations, till he took root beneath the shining looms of Albion's daughters in Philistine by the side of Amalek. They have divided Levi. He hath shot out into forty-eight roots over the land of Canaan. They have divided Judah. He hath took root in Hebron, in the land of Hyde and Hyle, Hand and Hyle, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, roll apart from all the nations of the earth to dissipate into non-entity. I see a feminine form arise from the four terrible Zoas, beautiful but terrible, struggling to take a form of beauty. Rooted in Seshem, this is Dinah, the youthful form of Aaron, the wound I see in South Moulton Street and Stratford Place, where Joseph and Benjamin rolled apart away from nations, the nations. In vain they rolled apart. They are fixed into the land of Kabul. And Rahab, Babylon the Great, hath destroyed Jerusalem. Bath stood upon the Severn with Merlin and Blouded and Arthur, the cup of Rahab in his hand, her poisons twenty-sevenfold, and all her twenty-seven heavens, now hid and now revealed, appear in strong delusive light of time and space, drawn out in shadowy pomp by the eternal prophet created evermore for Los in six thousand years, walks up and down continually, 
that not one moment of time be lost and every revolution of space he makes permanent in Bola Hula and Cathedron. And these, the names of the 27 heavens and their churches, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, these are the giants mighty, Hermaphroditic, Noah, Shem, Aphraxid, Canaan the second, Salah, Heber, Pelig, Ro, Sereg, Nahor, Terra. These are the female males, a male within a female, hid as in an ark and curtains. Abraham, Moses, Solomon, Paul, Constantine, Charlemagne, Luther. These seven are the male females, the dragon forms, the female hid within a male. Thus Rahab is revealed, mystery, Babylon the Great. Thus Rahab is revealed, mystery, Babylon the Great, the abomination of desolation, religion hid in war, a dragon red and a hidden harlot. But Jesus breaking through the central zones of death and hell opens eternity in time and space triumphant in mercy. But Jesus breaking through the central zones of death and hell opens eternity in time and space, triumphant in mercy. Thus are the heavens formed by Los within the mundane shell. And where Luther ends, Adam begins again in eternal circle to awake the prisoners of death to bring Albion again with Luva into light eternal in his eternal day. To bring Albion again with Luva into light eternal in his eternal day. Thus are the heavens formed by Los within the mundane shell. And where Luther ends, Adam begins again in eternal circle to awake the prisoners of death to bring Albion again with Luva into light eternal in his eternal day. But now the starry heavens are fled from the mighty limbs of Albion.